All right, thank you for the introduction, Alexander, and thanks for, for the invite, of course, uh, to this uh, seminar series. Uh, so I'll be presenting some work today, mostly carried out by my PhD student, uh, Brent Sprangers, uh, who's uh, here in the title, as you can see, you should be able to see my mouse, hopefully. Um, well, okay, it will be better the contrast on my white slides. Um, and so, as mentioned, my talk will be about group invariant tensor train networks for supervised uh, learning. So I should have an outline or an overview over here. So I'll just give a brief introduction to supervised uh, learning or, or the setup that we want to consider here. And then I'll, I'll briefly uh, introduce group invariant tensors. So, so what are tensors? What are multilinear functions? And um, what are these invariances and, and these group structure that I want to uh, refer to? And then the main uh, novel contribution that Brent uh, carried out was a more efficient way of constructing such group invariant tensors uh, as compared to what existed in the literature. And then we'll see that um, after you have uh, this type of technology, you can kind of combine it into tensor train networks. And that's really an interesting technology if you're thinking about uh, supervised learning applications. So at the end, I'll, I'll have some experimental res results about some um, prototype and, and maybe less prototype applications that we uh, had a look at. All right, so introduction. Uh, yeah, my slides are quite full, uh, as you can see, um, but you know uh, they are there uh, for your comfort. So maybe afterwards you can uh, still read the slides and. Uh, figure out what I what I talked about mainly. So the setup for today is that we're going to think about some supervised machine learning um, problems. And at a very high level, the idea in supervised machine learning is that I'll be providing you suitable amounts of data, um, basically inputs and outputs. And what I want you to accomplish is essentially to pick a nice function that can predict um, uh, essentially uh, the, the given data, right? You want to kind of maximize some performance criterion, let's say the accuracy on some testing uh, data set. And the problem itself would be to figure out a good function from a, a function class. Uh, so uh, let's say a model family, which is parameterized by, let's say these parameters alpha over here, there's uh, in this case p parameters and you just want to figure out what's a good uh, function that can kind of explain the data that was given to me and of course there's many 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 different model classes that you can consider you could think about linear models quadratic models um, so so these types of regression that you can see over here you can think about graphical models uh, and probably most well-known technique would be uh, neural networks of course all right and then um, specific performance criterions could be trying to maximize prediction error um, or the prediction um, well you don't want to maximize prediction error you want to minimize that uh, or you want to maximize the accuracy of course on some given set of data all right now something that has been realized in in more recent years uh, as is uh, very nicely illustrated in this picture over here that i took from the web is that you know you sometimes want your problem or, or sometimes it happens that your problem has some type of uh, invariances to it. So if you're thinking about maybe some uh, imaging application, let's say I provide to you a bunch of images uh, and your task is to put a bounding box around, uh, let's say, uh, women in the picture, right? I think it's International Women's Day today. So let's say you want to put a bounding box around every woman in the picture. It's very clear that if you would rotate the picture by 90 degrees, for example, the bounding box would also have to be rotated by precisely 90 degrees. So you see that the function that you're trying to learn there has some type of extra structure. And you would like to incorporate this extra structure into the machine learning models that you're considering. And so I think um, this type of uh, observation was maybe spurred by um, by the observation in this picture over here, if you think about convolutional neural networks specifically, uh, you would see that if you would first shift your image and then perform the convolution, it's actually the same as first performing the convolution and then shifting the image. 
So mathematically, you could write this down as saying, well, the, let's say F is my model. I first apply the shift to the data. It's actually the same as first applying the model and then afterwards applying the shift. Okay, so uh, very mathematically, you would even say that this is a commuting uh, diagram. And uh, in, in this case, uh, the shift map and the convolution map are both linear maps. So this equation even says that it's kind of uh, commuting linear maps in this per precise uh, case. Okay, so at some point it was realized that actually this is a pretty good idea. So you may want to explicitly encode into your machine learning models some type of um, constraints, you could say, okay? And for example, let's say your machine learning model ultimately is some function that goes from some input space to some output space. And maybe you could consider constraints of the following nature, something that people would usually call invariance. So you perform some change of the input with a map A. Usually this map A is linear. Um, so you apply this linear map, let's say A, to the input. And then what happens is, well, nothing. It is actually the same as just applying F to X, okay? This is something we would call, uh, or would be called in the machine learning literature, an, an invariance relation. Uh, you can also have something more complicated where maybe you perform some, some specific change to the input A. Uh, so you apply A to X. And then what happens is not that you just get F of X, not like in invariance case, but rather there is some additional transformation uh, being applied, but you know what this transformation will be. So you would know both what A and B are. Uh, and this typically in the machine learning literature is, is called an equivariance uh, relation. There's an extremely nice uh, PhD thesis uh, from uh, Cohen, uh, which is called equivariant convolutional networks that uh, I think mostly develops these types of, of ideas about how to explicitly um, constrain convolutional networks using these type of equivariance relations. Uh, and of course, you can see that by taking B to be the identity map, it, it, equivariance is, is um, uh, kind of more general than invariance in some sense, okay? Of course, these ideas were not, um, it's a very interesting idea of explicitly incorporating this type of constraints, uh, but it's not uh, not uh, accurate to say, oh, this is really the first time that people thought about incorporating um, these type of, of, let's say, invariance and equivariances into uh, machine learning models. Uh, I think the, the, the key point is that Cohen um, and, and Welling, uh, when they proposed this technique, they would do this in an explicit way. And there have been a lot of researchers into doing this in a more implicit way, usually, uh, or this can be accomplished uh, typically using uh, some uh, data augmentation strategies. So there's an extremely simple way to, uh, if we think about this uh, convolutional network again, or if we think about the um, bounding box problem again, there's a very uh, easy way to augment your data set by rotating, for example, each image by 90 degrees, and you would rotate the corresponding output also by 90 degrees. And you would also feed this as extra training data to your machine learning um, pipeline. And in this way, you would uh, kind of in an implicit way force the model to potentially learn that if you do a 90 degree rotation, then also the output is, is uh, rotated by 90 degrees in that particular setup. Right. What I want to talk about here in this talk is not about neural networks though, uh, but it's about uh, very simple tensor-based uh, machine learning models that you can use for supervised learning. And the, the basic setup, uh, which was described here in this paper by Sudenmayer and Schwab, is that you would take your input space, let's say your vectors, they live in RM, you map it first with a feature map to a, a space like this. So basically a, a collection of vectors of, of different lengths, depending on the feature map that you're choosing. Uh, and then, so, so this is a very similar to a kernel method, of course. And then you apply this uh, feature that you've computed here, you supply them as an input to a multilinear map. Okay, and this multilinear map, it takes a bunch of inputs and then sends it to some other vector space. I will, I will return to this point about what, what it exactly means to be a multilinear map. Okay, um, 
it has to be said though that if f would be really be a general multilinear map without any other constraints uh, this would be computationally very expensive actually to evaluate such a map so in order to really if you think about kernel methods you need some type of kernel trick right you go from a low dimensional space to a high dimensional space and and then you still want to apply in this high dimensional space um, your classifier in this case it would be like a linear map um, a multilinear map uh, you would have to apply it in an efficient way so you need some type of kernel trick and how we can accomplish this will be at the very end of the talk Okay, but first I want to uh, talk a bit more about multilinear maps and how they relate to tensors. Now, before I do this, uh, the central question that I want to investigate here is, suppose that we have this type of setup where we do this kernel map uh, to a bunch of vector spaces, and then we do this multilinear map that we apply to the data. What I now would like to do is I would like to construct or put constraints on these multilinear maps, on these multilinear maps F, in such a way that they satisfy these equivariance or invariance relationships. Now, here in the case of multilinear maps, it's slightly more complicated because we have a bunch of vector spaces, as you can see over here. So V1 up to VK are the input spaces. VK plus one would be my output space. And what I would like to impose is, well, essentially I've chosen a bunch of relevant, uh, in some way, invertible linear maps. So these MGIs that go from the VI space to the VI space. And what I want my map to satisfy is if I transform my first input with the first map, my second input with the second map and so on, then I really get just the evaluation at the original inputs but then at the output, there is some type of transformation applied, okay? That's the ID, the setup for today. And I want to understand, okay, who are these multilinear maps that satisfy this type of relations? Because of course, an arbitrary multilinear map will not satisfy um, any given set of such uh, equations, right? And, and I, I have to mention here certainly that most of this work that we were doing was really trying to understand some prior work by uh, Finzi, Welling, and Wilson. So they had this nice paper out there, um, but there were some steps in, in this paper that were not uh, immediately clear to us why, uh, why they considered things in the way that they considered it. And so part of this presentation will be about, okay, trying to build up in a more uh, slow way to what they ultimately get to. And then we will propose an alternative algorithm for more efficiently solving uh, this type of problem. All right, so what I first want to talk about is the relation to uh, tensors from, um, from multilinear maps. So uh, if you think about a multilinear map, okay, what is a multilinear map? Well, you see it in this slide over here. It's essentially a map that, okay, you put in a bunch of inputs, and then let's say at one of the inputs, you make some linear combination. Then what happens is that you get a linear combination at the output. So it really means that if you would fix the vectors in all of these input vector spaces, except for one, and there you make a linear combination, then this linear combination, it, it basically factors through. Okay, so it means that this map is linear in each of its arguments separately. Okay, this uh, probably is very well known to you. S potentially slightly less well known is uh, this uh, universal property of the tensor product that you can read about all of in, in this uh, reference over here that basically states that there is a, a bijection between multilinear functions f and uh, order uh, k plus one tensors uh, like this. So remember that our multilinear function, it took inputs in this vector space vi. Uh, so this is why there's a dual over here. It took inputs in the second vector space and in the k vector space over here, and then it outputs in this space over here. So what is written here, uh, this here is, is formally speaking, it's a, it's a tensor. It's a, a thing that lives in a tensor product of vector spaces. And from this type of formula, you may already um, see why there is this relation uh, to multilinear uh, functions. Okay, it will become more clear in the next slide. 
Uh, so this notation uh, star, it, it means that it's a dual space of VI. So the, the linear space of functions uh, from the vector space VI to uh, the real numbers in this case. All right. So how, how does this correspondence look like? Well, it's actually very, very similar to uh, the relation between a linear map and a matrix. In fact, uh, it, it's a generalization of, of this setup. So if you remember from basic linear algebra, if you, if you need to determine the matrix that represents a linear map after you choose some bases, the idea is essentially that you take the basis vectors and you apply the linear map to this, and then you put those vectors that you obtain as the columns in a matrix, right? Uh, and essentially the same idea applies to these multilinear maps. So over here in this uh, very um, ugly looking expression, you see here, you take this tensor product of these uh, special vectors over here. And these vectors over here, they're the dual vectors um, of, of some orthonormal basis. Okay, so, so it's all in the slide here. So what's a dual vector uh, that's explained over here. So you apply this um, ej star i to the ej uh, prime i, then you just get the Kronecker delta of j and j prime. So it's like, uh, think about just a transposition um, of, of uh, column vectors, essentially. So these would be row vectors, all right? So what is written over here is basically a basis vector that you take from this tensor product space. And then when you would evaluate the function at precisely this basis vector, this is the output, okay? So in the matrix case, you would say, oh, I take one of the basis vectors, and in that column, I put the evaluation of my linear map. So there's, in, in that case, just one input, okay? So this is the, the complete uh, analogous um, observation for tensors, essentially. And in this way, you can represent, uh, in fact, a multilinear map by a tensor, an abstract tensor, as you've seen on the previous slide, but any abstract tensor, you can also represent them in coordinates by essentially a box of numbers. And, and then literally here is my box of uh, numbers that you can see over here. Uh, and you see the number of uh, elements in this box of numbers. It's like N1, which is a dimension of V1 uh, by, pa, pa, pom, uh, by NK, which is a dimension of VK by uh, nk plus one, which was a dimension of the vk plus one space. And essentially you can think of this box of numbers as containing, so it's like a grid, a grid of size n1 up to nk. And at each grid point, there is this function evaluation, right? And the function evaluation, this guy over here, is actually a vector of length nk plus one, right? So you have a box, uh, a grid, and at each point in this grid, there is essentially a vector of length nk plus one containing numbers, okay? And this is good because this allows us to understand that, okay, when we make such a machine learning model where we say, oh, we do this kernel map into this uh, product of, of Euclidean spaces, and then I take these vectors and I supply them to a multilinear function, it really means that I, I can represent these multilinear functions in bases as tensors, as a, just a box of numbers, and I can use this box of numbers. So in some way, uh, very literally, in fact, this space of multilinear maps is precisely or isomorphic uh, to this space of, of boxes filled up with numbers. And we can even see how many numbers there are. There's exactly this amount of numbers. Okay, so it's actually quite big space of, of functions, right? And this would be our function space, our model space, of course, without currently any constraints applied, okay? So if you want to uh, think about our machine learning setup, we would be learning or be trying to learn this function f over here. And we can do this because essentially we can, uh, it's, it's an optimization problem over a Euclidean space of a, of a quite large uh, size, which uh, of course is unfeasible and we will solve that problem later. All right. That was about the relation between multilinear maps and tensors. Now, what I wanted to study in, in the central part was I want to impose some constraints on multilinear maps. So we've seen already that there's a, a very natural way to put some uh, relations, some invariance relations. Namely, I transform some of the inputs in some way. And what happens is, well, actually, you just have the original evaluation of the untransformed things. 
and then at the end you perform some additional transformations okay we call uh, this tuple of things so this uh, mg1 up to mgk we can put them in just a tuple um, and we call that an invariance relation okay and so each of these mg uh, i's this is a, a linear map an invertible linear map so it's an element of this uh, automorphism group on the vector spaces to be very, very precise but you can just think about invertible uh, matrices essentially all right great so I have to mention here that uh, this idea, of course, was studied by Cohen and Welling, um, and they introduced this idea of gene variance for groups. So they somehow start out by saying, oh, you want to have a group, and this group has uh, some type of representation as matrices, and that's what you will impose on, on the functions. So the first thing we really tried to understand was, well, this setup here seemed to us more natural. Like, I have a, a bunch of, of transformations that I want to apply to my input, and I know what should happen at the output. Just a priori, a bunch of linear maps that I know, like I translate uh, or maybe I rotate something by 90 degrees at the input, and I know that there should be a rotation of 90 degrees at the output, for example. Um, so that seemed to us like much more natural as saying, okay, you just want to, you have a set of relations, you impose them, and, and that's it. Now, it turns out that when you do this, there's actually more invariance relations that will be satisfied by F just by imposing the invariance relations that I put over here. Okay, And so it's, it's actually a very basic result. You can show that it's the, the set of all the invariance relations that are satisfied by F when you impose on F uh, that it um, satisfies the invariance relations on the previous slides, then this set equipped with the composition of, of functions, so just uh, let's say matrix multiplication, then this is actually a group. And so it, it can e very easily do the algebra. Let's say if you have a two sets of transformations like this, and you say, okay, let's look what happens when I compose them. I first apply the first type, then I apply the second type, and I do this, of course, at all of the inputs. And now you say, aha, but you know, I could parent I could put parentheses around this guy over here and over here, and that would just be some vector. And since this MH is one of my invariance relations, it means I can pull out the MH uh, from, from this uh, from inside, basically. So I can pull out the MH, so I get the MH K plus one over here, and then I apply F to whatever remains. So I remove these H's guys inside, I move them outside, and I still end up with this guy. But then you say, ah, but you know, MG was also one of my invariance relations, so I can pull out the MG, and it goes over here. So it just goes in front of the, of the MH over here. Uh, and uh, well, of course, you pulled out all of the MGs, so you're, you're left with uh, this function evaluation on the original data. All right. And so you see that when you do this composite um, transformation, you also get the corresponding composite transformation at the output. So this really shows that when you compose these linear maps uh, in this tuple everywhere, then it's also one of the invariance relations that is satisfied by F, even if you did not explicitly impose it, it's automatically satisfied. And similarly, you can show uh, the same thing happens for the inverse transformation. So all of our um, matrices, as mentioned, they are invertible matrices. And so you can also show that if you would, uh, if you would consider this equation over here, we have this MJ over here, I put the inverses of MJ inside and consider that transformation. Now I can do the opposite. I can say, well, I can pull inside this guy over here. It's an invariance relation. So I'm allowed to pull it inside of my F in this way. So I'm putting MG in front everywhere. And then you see, well, okay, this here is just the identity. This here is just the identity. So I end up with this F guy over here. And now looking at this relation at the, at the extreme ends, you see that if you move this guy to the other side, so you left multiply with this inverse of this guy, you again have F applied to the inverse transformations results in the inverse transformation of this guy and then F 
which is precisely the invariance relation for the inverse, uh, for all of the inverses of this guy. Uh, and this uh, implies, in fact, that this will be the inverse element of uh, Mj in this particular group with uh, composition. Okay, so the key point, the key takeaway is that when you impose just a set of invariance relations, you automatically get a group structure, which is uh, quite nice, I would say. And then secondly, it turns out that there is a, just a little bit more structure. So this um, set of invariances G with this composition, it's a, it's a tuple basically of, of linear maps. You can consider this uh, projection map. So you, so you, I have a bunch of um, linear transformations, and I can just look at what happens if I just look at one of these transformations. So I go from the tuple here to the MI. Uh, it turns out that this map over here, this projection, is a group homomorphism. So it basically preserves group structures. Uh, the group structure, of course, uh, is, is from the automorphism group, so you can compose linear maps. Uh, that's, that's basically it. Uh, and indeed, you can see that the necessary relations are, are satisfied. If you take the identity map in the group over here, then it gets mapped to the identity map. You, you can easily check that this is the identity element for this group G. And you can also check that if I make a composition of two group elements and then project it, it's actually the same as projecting the first one and then composing with the projection of the second one. So you can verify these. Uh, it's a typical group theory thing. You just need to write down the algebra and you see immediately that this is true. Uh, now you could say, well, okay, that's that's really nice that these projection maps are um, <clears throat> group homomorphisms, but why in God's name would you care about that? And that's a great question. Uh, this actually is something that is studied uh, quite a bit in... in um, in group uh, theory in algebra and a map row that goes from a group into a set of um, so the group in fact of automorphisms on v so remember this is just invertible linear maps uh, which basically takes your abstract group g it could be any extremely abstract group it really means that this map row allows you to represent this abstract group as very concrete objects namely invertible matrices. And the action is always composition of matrices. So this is a technique that they use in group theory to try to understand your group G. Yeah, you have this abstract group, but you can basically realize it as some type of a matrix uh, subgroup. And you can, uh, as, as we all know, matrices are, are much nicer to study in some sense. It is very concrete uh, rather than this abstract group G. Okay, and so this is why uh, this this type of setup, this type of map that that is a, a group homomorphism, this is called a group representation of this group G on the vector space V. Okay, I see there is a, a question or a hand uh, raised. I don't know if there is something in the chat. This I I cannot. Ah uh, yes, sorry, I, I just had a question. Uh, I'm a little confused with this notation for the M. Uh, yes. So could I could I just have uh, rewrite it as M G one and M G two or M G I and would that be would that mean the same? Yes, yes, exactly. So the M H is a is an element of the group. I I didn't put it on this slide, but yes, yes. So you can just write G one and G two and uh, okay. yeah. And then one of the earlier slides you had G uh, the cardinality going from one to S, but yes, it's not a finite set, right? G is just here I'm I'm dealing exclusively with the finite, uh, finitely generated groups. So my S is in fact a finite number, and I'm only considering here um, finite or finitely generated groups. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. extending this to uh, groups with uh, non-finite cardinality, so maybe something like Lie groups, is a very interesting question. Uh, there is some discussion of this in the in the paper by Finzi, Welling, and, and um, Wilson, but I will not discuss this. So I, I will, what we have developed here is uh, only working for finitely generated groups. All right, thanks. Yeah. All right. So this is, um, so when we have these invariants over here, it automatically has this group structure and actually it can be interpreted as a uh, representation. So it's not only 
that it has this loop structure, but it can also be interpreted as being a representation of some abstract group, right? So I started here very concretely. I said, I have these transformations and I, I know these transformations from my application domain. I impose these uh, guys, I want to have this structure. And it turns out that this corresponds to something that is called a, a group representation of this very specific group. Um, and group representation on these vector spaces that, that are there. This construction here, since we have this interpretation, it also allows you to think of this as saying, well, you could actually start out with some type of abstract group. And I think this could be useful. Let's say you start out with a problem where you have a finite set and there is some natural group acting on this finite set. And you're thinking about, oh, I could do something like a one hot encoding of the elements in this finite set. And it's extremely likely that you can also find a representation of your group uh, on the space where you do the one hot encoding, right? And in this way, you could really start out with this abstract group that really makes sense on your, let's say, finite domain in that case, because we're only dealing with finite groups here. And in this way, it would be a more a general setup. And in some way, uh, so, so if you go to the original uh, paper that we started from, they really start out from this idea that you have this uh, group representation, but it's not really explained, you know, how did they get to this idea that it must be group representations. Uh, and so that's that's explained a bit here, and also in the in the work we did with Brent, there's a bit of an explanation of uh, that actually makes a lot of sense that you end up with these group uh, representation uh, theoretic stuff over here. Okay, so uh, in summary, uh, that's all on the slide over here. I want to impose these type of relations with a finite number of of uh, transformations that I know beforehand from my application domain, and what you find out in the, in the terminology of representation theory is that my function f is something that is called a, a g invariant uh, map. So my f is invariant under this group here. And more specifically, it's invariant with respect to a specific choice of representation. So it actually depends on this choice. This name is a bit strange because it seems to suggest it's invariant under the group, but it's dependence actually on the chosen representation. But nonetheless, this is the standard name in, in representation theory, uh, as you can find, for example, in uh, Lang's algebra book. All right. Um, great. Yes, um, that's what I wanted to talk about there. Okay. So now I've discussed like two separate items, right? So I've discussed that, okay, we start out in a supervised learning setting. We do this kernel map. We have these multilinear maps that I want to use. I've already explained to you that multilinear maps are somehow like tensors. They're boxes of numbers and I can optimize over, you know, a, a, a finite dimensional vector space. I'm very confident we can do that. And on the other hand, I said, okay, now I want to impose some invariance relations to my multilinear map because it's, it's very natural to do that. And I find out that, okay, there is a name for what I want to do. And it's called something like a G invariance, a group invariance of this map F. Now, the very natural question is, okay, that's really nice. But what I want to do ultimately is I want to be able to optimize over my maps. I want to be able to choose the correct model from my family of multilinear maps that have these constraints imposed. And currently, I only know how to optimize over these unconstrained multilinear maps. So the real question here is, these relations that I have imposed on the multilinear map how do they translate to my tensor? What, what happens to my tensor? How are these constraints going to manifest themselves on the tensor, on this box of numbers? And, and that's a great question. Actually, it's, um, it's a reasonably uh, straightforward. But again, I need this uh, very uh, ugly explanation of some tensor notation. If you've heard about multilinear multiplication, that is what I'm being, uh, what I'm defining here on this slide. If you have not heard about this uh, operation, you can look at this thing over here. So a tensor is always a linear combination of this type of tensor. So you can show that any tensor F can be expressed in this way. So these would be 
the coefficients with respect to some basis vectors like this. So if you think about matrices, literally what I'm writing here are the coefficients of my matrix with respect to some basis. And this would be like row vectors and this would be like column vectors. Okay, so there is some way to express your tensor like that. And now let's suppose I give you a bunch of linear maps. I give you some maps that go from, from these vector spaces. So from the, this dual vector space VI into the dual vector space uh, VI again. And then I also have a transformation. So some linear map acting on the output space uh, VK plus one, VK plus one over Q, all right? Um, there is kind of a, if I, if I give you these maps, the, the thing that you will come up automatically is exactly what is written over here. So if I, if I have these maps and I want to somehow apply them to this tensor, well, I know that this vector VJ1 uh, star, this is kind of defined to be a vector in VI, sorry, in V1 dual. And this vector over here, it really lives in VK dual. And if I give you a bunch of maps that transform the space V1 dual into V1 dual, it kind of makes sense that you want to apply the U1 uh, that transforms the first space, a dual of the first space. Uh, you just want to apply it over here to the, to the one vector that you have in that space, okay? And the same for, for this guy over here and the same for this guy over here. So it's, it's really the only way in which you can logically apply these maps uh, anyway, okay? So you can... Think of this in coordinates. If you have the box of numbers, I'm going to give you a bunch of matrices and you can multiply the tensor on all sides with this type of uh, matrices. And this is called a multilinear uh, multiplication. Okay. And the notation I use for this is uh, this tensor product over here. If you think about um, this thing over here, this tensor product, if you interpret this as a Kronecker product, uh, the equation is equally valid provided that you think about F as a, as a column vector. Uh, and in some way, F is a column vector. Uh, the tensor space is a linear space. Um, so, so this, if you know about Kronecker products, about matrices, you can think of this as a Kronecker product of matrices applied to some vector. Right. And so then uh, one of the um, first statements uh, that we have in, in the work with uh, Brand is the following. Let's say that we have our nice multilinear map F that we've been uh, studying for the past uh, couple of minutes. And suppose that F, um, the calligraphic F is the associated tensor. And suppose also that I give you some abstract group, uh, a finitely generated group where the generators of the group are this G1 of UGS. And recall that um, previously I, I said, okay, maybe these, uh, group elements here, there are these tuples, these invariance relations, right? Okay, and suppose that in addition to this uh, abstract group, I have a way to represent this group as invertible linear maps, so as invertible matrices, essentially. So this, this last part over here would be equivalent to, okay, I have these invariance relations that I have imposed, okay? Then it turns out that F my multilinear map is G invariant. So it has these, um, you know, you transform the input and you get the corresponding uh, predicted out, uh, transformation at the output. If and only if the following statement is true about the associated tensor. So my associated tensor should be equal to some type of multilinear transformation or multiplication of this tensor itself, right? And what is this? Um, this transformation, well, it's given by these group representations. So if you think about uh, our original setting again, I had these um, linear maps that I kind of imposed in my equation. These are appearing over here. I just need to tensor all of them together or take the Kronecker product of all of them together. And then what I want is if you apply this to F, I get F again. So you see here why, why people would call this an invariance, right? The G invariance, okay? There is something slightly strange. Uh, there is this starting over here. It's a, it's a, you would immediately think about a dual map. Um, but here, uh, this dual, it's, so it's not a dual map. It's, it's a dual representation, which is defined to be the inverse of the transpose uh, map, okay? So if you think about the matrix, you literally transpose the matrix and invert the matrix. This actually, so 
indeed, this is an interesting point why you have this inverse transpose. It's not really what you expect. You may have just expected to have the, the transpose, for example, because it's like a dual thing. Um, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So if you start out with a, a map F that goes from a vector space V to W, if you consider the inverse map, it goes from W to V. If you look at the transpose map, it goes from the dual of W to the dual of V. But here you see, I want to transform a VI space, dual, a dual VI space into something else, right? So this would be my VI space in some sense. And I would want to transform it into something else, let's say a WI space. So I really need like, I need the inverse of this thing so that this space ends up over here and that space ends up over there. That's a, I mean, the very intuitive definition why um, the more precise definition you can find, for example, in Lang's algebra book, why exactly you need this um, inverse transpose. But I, I give an example, uh, ah, even on the next slide, where you can see that just if you if you think about linear maps and matrices, you immediately see how this uh, inverse transpo, uh, transpose arises. So if you think about a linear map uh, just between two vector spaces V and W, and we want to impose an equality like this. So we say, okay, for all the vectors, what I want to do is if I take my uh, linear map F and I first transform the input with M, I get just apply F to V, but then transform the output with L. So this is the, the, the specific case where the multilinear map just takes one input vector and then you have a, a linear map, okay? So this would be the equation that I want my map F uh, to satisfy. So we can just study this with matrix technology. What happens over here? Well, since this composition uh, on the left, it's a composition of linear maps applied to V. And this on the right is also a composition of linear maps applied to V. I know that if this equation holds for all V, it really means that the linear maps must be the same linear map. So what I really have is an equality of linear maps. L of F is equal to F of M. Or if you think about matrices, this matrix multiplied with that matrix is uh, this F matrix again multiplied with M, okay? And then you say, aha, but this is an invertible matrix. I apply on the right the M inverse and I end up with this nice equation over here. L, uh, well, let's say multiplied with F, multiplied with M inverse is again F. And then you, you may know these uh, properties of the Kronecker product that state if you would vectorize the left-hand side and you would vectorize the right-hand side, you end up with precisely this equation over here. The M inverse here is being transposed and you put it in front, so you get this M inverse transpose, and the L, you just keep it. And then you apply this to the vectorization of F, and this is equal to the vectorization of the, of the right-hand side. And this is exactly the same expression as in the previous slide. The one transformation that you apply in the input gets the inverse transpose, and the one at the output, nothing happens to that. All right, so that, that's an example for linear maps, and essentially the multilinear case is an extension of that. All right, now the interesting part uh, that uh, Brent and I uh, worked on was on how to efficiently construct the tensors F that satisfy this type of equation. So if you look at the equation now here, it's in the general case. So you can just think that D is equal to K plus one, but it also works in, in this uh, case as well. So we have um, from the two slides back, we have that F should be equal to this, um, let's say Kronecker product of matrices applied to F. And this should be true for all the group elements uh, in G or uh, just for the generators, in fact. So if you go back to the statement, it actually says it suffices that it holds for, um, well, okay, here it says for all the group elements, but actually this should be like um, for the generators. Yes, here it says, okay. So for all the G that are in the set of the generators of the group. Okay, perfect. So uh, if you look at this equation, if you think about this as matrices, this is, this is beautiful. It's, it's a simultaneous eigenvector problem. This is saying that, well, F, if you think of this as a vector and you think of this as a matrix, it says that, well, I apply a matrix to a vector and I end up with the vector. So this really means that F must be an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue one of this particular matrix. And 
Additionally, this should hold for all the group elements. So I have a bunch of matrices of which the same F is the eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue one. So it's a type of a simultaneous eigenvector problem. And the, the question is, okay, how do you solve this? It's uh, immediately clear actually from, from this observation that um, the set of G invariant tensors is actually a linear subspace of the set of tensors. And that's particularly nice because if you think about our multilinear maps, we can represent them with tensors. A tensor is a box of numbers. It's a, it's a linear space. And the tensors that are invariant under these invariance relations, they live in a linear subspace. So if I can just figure out a basis for this subspace, I know that I can represent all of these tensors as some linear combination of those basis vectors. And then I could optimize over the, uh, the choice of the uh, coordinates, essentially, with respect to the basis. And that's, that's, in fact, how we do the machine learning uh, pipeline at the very end of the presentation. OK, so uh, in the remainder, I will just talk about orthogonal group representations, which means that this uh, row of G is, a, if you think about matrices, is an orthogonal matrix. OK, after choosing some inner product on V, uh, et cetera. OK, the nice thing is for an orthogonal representation, if you look at this thing over here, if you take the inverse transpose of an orthogonal matrix, it's just the matrix itself. OK, and this means we can simplify the notation a bit. And then the observation that we had was the following. So uh, it, it's, in fact, a well-known uh, observation, of course, that if you take a tensor product of matrices, let's say, and you would know the eigen decomposition of each of these individual matrices. So I know the one for this one. I know the one for this one and, and for all the others appearing here. Then you can actually tensor them up in, in the way shown over here, like this. And this will give you the eigen decomposition of this guy on the left. Okay, so if you know the eigen decompositions of uh, a bunch of matrices, then you also know the eigen decomposition of the tensor product of those matrices or the Kronecker product of these matrices. And they are like this. And so then what we propose is let's look. Uh, so this guy over here, this is still, of course, a diagonal matrix. Let's look at all the eigenvalues corresponding to one. So the ones that are exactly equal to one in this a big diagonal matrix over here. So basically it means that I need to take some product of uh, individual eigenvalues uh, that appear on the diagonal uh, entries of these diagonal matrices here. And I need to find the combinations that, uh, that multiply up to, to one. And I will take the corresponding columns uh, of this matrix here. Okay, so the eigenvalues that are one in this big tensor product, I will select the corresponding columns from this huge matrix over here. And I will formally denote this matrix by, by this thing over here. So if you've seen this notation, it's like the katri rao product of these matrices is defined to be, um, to be this thing. Uh, yes, and so these would be the ones corresponding to the uh, product equal to one, okay? And then the nice thing is, well, if I have to be invariant, so if I have to satisfy this simultaneous eigen decomposition problem, and I uh, now I just look at one, right? I just looked at one element G, and I find, oh, actually, it needs to live in this subspace. My solution must live in this subspace over here. I just need to impose all the other constraints as well. And how can I do this? Well, if you think a bit about Krylov methods, I can kind of project onto this uh, subspace that I already identified. I know that my subspace of interest lies in the subspace that I already identified. So I can kind of perform a compression of my problem. So I could say, well, this is uh, actually equivalent to projecting on the left with this U star uh, Hermitian, um, and then uh, on the right with the U star of these type of tensor product matrices. And the nice thing is that this type of product that you see over here, it can be computed in an efficient way, of course, provided that U star does not have many columns. So if it, it has a small number of columns, then this compression can be computed using some tensor structured whatever's uh, in, a, in a fairly efficient way. And I will show it in the algorithm later. The key thing that we found out is that 
this type of projected simultaneous eigen uh, problem can be reduced to a single eigen problem in a way that is, um, if you know about representation theory, it's it's a type of uh, refined version, you could say, of the first projection formula in representation theory for, for, for finite groups. Uh, but the key point is, uh, is, is given here, self-contained in this uh, proposition. If you have a bunch of unitary matrices that has a, a rightmost eigenvalue that is real, and you have some type of unitary, so this matrix here has a um, has orthogonal columns in the in the Hermitian inner product. So uh, as you see over here, if you then perform a compression of a bunch of these uh, unitary matrices and let these guys be AG, then you can solve an eigenproblem of this form. So a simultaneous eigenproblem. I have a bunch of matrices, different matrices, and I'm trying to find the V that is simultaneously an eigen uh, vector for all of these problems potentially with different eigenvalues, then you can solve it by just solving a single um, eigenproblem just for one matrix. And you need to take an average, okay? And this is, this is ex if, if you know about this first projection formula, uh, all these lambdas, they would be one, and you would indeed take the average of this operator and just you need to compute the um, invariant subspace uh, of that operator. So this is a result that is extremely uh, similar to this, but in a projected setting and in a way that is actually more efficient uh, for this tensor structure, all right? And so, so here's the algorithm that we kind of propose. You start out with your group. There is some type of designated element in your group. Uh, and then you say, okay, this designated element, let's compute the small scale eigen decomposition. So it has these representations on different vector spaces. You just compute eigen decompositions of these small scale matrices, usually small scale matrices. And then there is the, of course, the complicated step. This is the combinatorial part. You need to figure out, okay, which combinations of eigen uh, values, if you take the product, uh, are equal to one. So, so this is, of course, um, I mean, this is uh, the step in the algorithm that takes the most time, um, in, theoretically. Uh, of course, in practice, the, the complexity of this is, is kind of okay. I mean, if you implement this on a computer, it can be uh, vectorized uh, quite well. So, so this is sort of reasonable-ish. The, the constant is quite small in this uh, high complexity uh, term. Uh, and then you need to determine the corresponding basis vectors. And then this was the tensor magic that I was uh, mentioning. Then you uh, need to perform the computation that is shown over here. So you just need to take uh, the individual small pieces. So you see here in this um, UK matrix, these are all small matrices. I need to select some columns from these small matrices and I need to apply them to these uh, BI matrices, uh, which were um, these matrices here, the representation matrices, which are also small. So you do this type of transformation to them. So type kind of like an individual compression. And then you need to compute some uh, Hadamard product, so an element-wise product of these matrices, uh, averaging them out in, in some way, as shown over here. And then this is the unique eigen problem that you need to solve. So this, uh, so we solve it by doing the Schur decomposition, and then you have this uh, unitary um, matrix, which is nice. And then you find by multiplying this unitary matrix with the bases that you have extracted before, you multiply them up. And in this way, you end up with an orthonormal basis for your uh, space of interest. So orthonormal here in the Hermitian inner product, okay? So this is actually an algorithm to find a basis of tensors that are invariant under these relations that we originally imposed on our multilinear map. Okay, and now we go back to our original setting. So um, um, this part is quite short. So we had this uh, learning setup where we said, okay, we have this kernel map and it goes into the space over here, which is still a reasonably low dimensional space. And then we apply some multilinear map to it. But mathematically what happens is that this composition, so this multilinear map after you do the kernel map is actually the same as you do the kernel map and then you tensor the result and then you apply the tensor that represents F. And this kind of emphasizes that 
this kernel map here, when you supply it to this multilinear map, it's, it's very similar in spirit to a kernel method in the sense that it really maps into a very high dimensional space. And then you do something linear in this high dimensional space. Now, the, the trick that we still need is some type of kernel trick. We still need to apply the linear map in an efficient way. And this is where the whole idea of tensor decompositions come into play, where you would say, well, I would not only like to have these invariant tensors, I would also like that these tensors have some type of compact representation. There's many different types of tensor decompositions that you could consider. The one that we considered was tensor trains. Um, it can be visualized like this. So essentially, the entries in this tensor are like a matrix chain multiplication. You can think of them uh, in this way. So it's like a vector multiplied with a bunch of matrices and multiplied again with a vector resulting in a number. And the visual representation of this is, is this guy over here. In our case, our tensor also has an output uh, vector space. So it, it looks like uh, this type of figure where one of these tensors of this uh, tensor train it has this output vector space, okay? And you can put the, the output space in any location that you like. The good news is that actually we don't need any other theoretical results. So if you are able to construct tensors that are invariant under um, a bunch of, uh, so, so these G invariant tensors, uh, that actually suffices in order to build tensor train decompositions that are also G invariant. And this is a result by Singh, Pfeiffer and Vidal. You can read about it uh, in this paper over here. So the key point is essentially that you can now use this technology to build tensors or multilinear maps that are invariant under some invariance relations and that simultaneously have a low rank tensor decomposition representation. Okay, and then we applied, of course, this technique to a, a bunch of uh, model problems. Here, what we are comparing is an algorithm that existed before, the one by Finzi, Welling, and Wilson, that also uh, contains a, a technique for constructing these bases uh, that uh, I discussed before. So there's these bases of uh, group invariant tensors, and uh, Finzi, Welling, and Wilson, so the orange lines, uh, they also built an algorithm for that. And the, the blue line over here is our method. So it's our alternative method, which uses um, this technique that with the compression and the reduction to a single eigen problem and so on. And you can see that for, uh, depending on the size of the vector spaces, we can get a good speed up between the, the blue line here and the, the green line here, or between this blue line here and between this orange line. So it's, it's really a two orders of magnitude in this uh, setup uh, for, for this group over here. And then for some different groups, you get some different results. It's some things I didn't mention. Um, I mentioned that you need to have this designated group element. And it's actually quite important that you choose a good designated element to get a good reduction in this compression step. But uh, you can read all about that in, in the paper, all right? We also did something uh, less straightforward. So we applied it to a transcription problem uh, for DNA. And it turns out that there, there is actually very interesting symmetry, which is called the reverse complement symmetry. You can read about it in, uh, in this paper. And uh, this complement invariance arises from some pairings that you can swap out. So you can swap the A and the T and the G and the C. And the reverse invariance um, supposedly relates to the fact that you can read the DNA from basically from front to back uh, or from back to front somehow, okay? So there are some very interesting symmetries. These have been exploited already in neural networks. So neural networks have been built that take into account these invariances. What we did is we built a tensor train of, of the structure that you can see here. Of course, it had many more sites um, not shown in the picture. And we imposed these type of invariances on our tensor train. So it can be modeled basically as a, as a, a parity group. So it's basically a zero one and with addition modulo two is, is basically this um, complement invariant. And the reverse invariance can also somehow be encoded. Um, 
great. And so this is the setup that we did. We, of course, we trained it uh, as uh, according to the parameters over here. So with binary cross entropy, softmax activation, we used stochastic gradient descent method and so on. We used, uh, of course, uh, a bunch of uh, parameter settings. And these here are different. Um, I think these are three different DNA strands. Uh, no, sorry, these are three different proteins. And there were 10,000 DNA strands that you're trying to predict if they bind to this protein, to this protein, or to this protein. You can see some, some of the parameters here. You can read all about it in the paper as well. And what we found is when we compare this invariant tensor trains technique to an existing um, also invariant neural network, uh, that in fact takes an additional invariance into account that we could not uh, or did not incorporate, you, we found that essentially we have state-of-the-art performance. So you can see the area under the ROC curve, uh, our method versus the benchmark. Here the benchmark is better by four percentage points. Here they're better by three percentage points. And on this final problem, we are better by five percentage points. So essentially, um, ball mark performance with a model which is of course much much simpler than the neural network that was considered so in conclusion these invariance relationships are actually naturally modeled by groups and this leads to the idea of these uh, group invariant tensor train networks we found a new method for more efficiently constructing these bases of invariant tensors using some some interesting tricks and um, this basically resulted in an uh, algorithm that can outperform uh, the original algorithm by Finzi, Welling, and uh, Wilson by up to several orders of, of magnitude. Okay, if you want more details, you can find it here in the, in the paper, uh, which is on archive, and we hope that it will be published uh, soon. So thanks for your attention.